Well, I've been interested in the human body in relation to the social sciences for some years, and I'm interested in the impact of technology and scientific advance on life extension, basically, and on the capacity of science, medical science, to transform our nature of our embodiment and um, have a big impact on life expectancy, mainly amongst the rich societies of the Northern Hemisphere. As a sociologist, I'm concerned by the consequences of these interventions by technology, improving um, life in many respects, but also raising big questions about inequality with respect to those societies that can't afford the new forms of technology that make life extension possible in the more developed world. Well, some of these technological interventions are on the borderland, as it were, between science fiction and what's really happening. So if you, if you take something like cryonics, we know that there are um, any number of people who've been frozen by cryonic techniques in American society or in the developed world. Um, and we also know that nanotechnology is beginning to be used in advanced surgery. But um, I'm interested in how the application of these techniques are going to change very fundamentally the nature of social relations in uh, the advanced world. Um, I've been trying to develop arguments against cultural relativism, arguing that uh, human rights legislation applies uh, to all human groups regardless of differences in language, culture, religion and so forth. Um, finding such an argument is difficult, but I have been trying to promote the notion that our vulnerability as embodied human mammalian creatures um, puts us into what I call a common risk community and that we share in common uh, problems of pain and suffering which um, unite us irrespective of cultural differences, language differences and so forth. Some of these arguments are philosophically problematic. I mean, I try to argue that pain is unified whereas pleasures are diverse and that um, uh, regardless of the cultural complexity of our pleasures, that um, basically toothache is toothache is toothache, namely that um, there are very fundamentally common aspects to pain uh, which we can measure in terms of greater or lesser, but they're, they're uh, shared much more fundamentally than common pleasures, for example. And in my notion of vulnerability, I'm trying to contrast that with the idea of frailty because I um, I'm trying to argue that vulnerability also has a kind of positive sense to it, that it, it's part of our sensitivity, part of our sensibility in responding to threats in the environment, whereas fra frailty suggests uh, something that's going to fall to bits, crack, uh, break apart and so forth. I think China is, a Chinese, China in the sense of porcelain, China is fr fragile in a way which the human body isn't particularly. I mean, I think the human body has capacities for regeneration and for revival, um, which um, makes the notion of vulnerability a more positive idea. Yes, well, whenever I've given talks like this on the body and vulnerability to medical audiences, I mean, they optimistically argue that medical in advance will solve all of the problems of ageing, vulnerability, disease, old age, impairment and so forth. Um, I think there are a number of problems with this argument. One is that um, while medicine has solved many of the problems of infectious diseases, they've been spectacularly unsuccessful in addressing many of the diseases related to old age, heart disease, stroke, cancer, uh, depressions, neurological diseases, and basically, we don't know what causes old age. I mean, even something as basic as that, I mean, what causes cells to age? And what is, what are, what is the ageing of cells? It hasn't really a clear answer yet. Um, medical, medical profession, the medical profession seems to think that their job is simply to keep life going. At least that's the official doctrine. I mean, in practice, doctors make pragmatic decisions about who can get resources and who can't. But I don't think that either social, social science or the medical sciences have really addressed the question, um, how is life justified, and in particular, how is life extension justified? <laughs> and in the work I've published, I've tried to sort of produce two possible arguments. One is that life could be, one's own life could be regarded as, a, as an artistic creation, and that we have a duty or self-responsibility to 
develop ourselves as best as we can. And the other argument, I think, is that insofar as we make contributions to the community, uh, then the resources that we extract out of the community can be justified. But the notion that the elderly rich can afford breast implants, um, you know, expensive uh, treatments uh, in cosmetic surgery and so forth, seems to me to be not, you know, not overtly justifiable as a use of scarce resources in a society where I think it's something like 47 million Americans don't have adequate um, health insurance, let alone um, cosmetic inventions, interventions and so forth. And I think, you know, you think of something very basic like uh, dental insurance. Uh, most Americans couldn't afford that even. So medical technology might make life um, extendable, but um, there's a difference between existence and um, life itself, I think. And uh, whilst medicine makes life, um, extends the existence of life, I think we need better arguments for understanding both the quality of life and the justification of extending life amongst the, the wealthy and the rich in modern society. Particularly when we think many African societies, you know, the life expectancy is actually declining. Some African society, societies are down as low as 28 years at birth. Um, it's probably better to measure that from five years onwards, but I mean, taking crude measures, if you compare Congo with Japan, I mean, the differences are extraordinary. Um, many Asian societies that are very wealthy, like Singapore, and to some extent some of the richer areas of North America are now faced by the problem of, you know, the greying of populations, the um, huge number of people who are living into their 80s and 90s. We've seen a huge increase in centenarians in the world. Um, I mean, the Queen, uh, the Queen of Great Britain used to send letters to, on the birthdays of people who became centenarians. She stopped doing it because there are too, too many of them. Um, so I think that um, some of the big challenges of modern society are to do with scarcity, overpopulation, degradation of the environment. And these are some of the areas where I think sociology or any of the social sciences need to be directed in terms of you know, the effort of our research should be into these crucial questions about resources, scarcity, pollution, the impact of um, aging populations on the labour force. And I'm particularly interested in generational justice, that is that um, if, as we have done in America, we've got rid of retirement for most people, um, what's the impact of these changes on the employment prospects of the young and the educated? And, I mean, we see this very much in academic life, that um, um, elderly professors never retire, they just have to be shot at some stage. So um, I think there are some issues in the academy about um, justice between generations and so on.